Hello, I am Michelle Davis of the Center for Manufacturing Research at Tennessee Tech University in Cookville, Tennessee. Welcome to the Fall 2018 Golden Eagle Additively Innovative Virtual Lecture Series. This is the sixth semester we have produced this popular and informative series. The series is hosted by TTU Center for Manufacturing Research and the iMaker Space at TTU. The CMR is recognized as an accomplished center of excellence that draws together resources from the state of Tennessee, the university, industries, and government funding agencies in a cooperative effort to be on the leading edge of the latest technological advances in the manufacturing field. The iMaker space, located in the Volpe Library on Tennessee Tech's campus, has the goal of providing an interactive and collaborative space for students and faculty to use in pursuit of innovative and entrepreneurial projects. Additive manufacturing is a focus of both entities, and as such, this short virtual lecture series has been planned to highlight the best practices, potential problems, technological advancements, innovations, and scientific contributions in additive manufacturing with expert talks from various institutions, industries, R&D centers, and laboratories. Today, we are honored to hear from Olaf Deagle, Professor of Product Development at Lund University in Sweden. His talk is titled, Design for Additive Manufacturing, The Key to Industrial Adoption of Additive Manufacturing. We request that you mute your microphones and phones during this presentation for the most optimal experience. The speaker will provide his contact information for questions after the presentation is over. Thank you, and now I turn the presentation over to Olaf. Thank you, Michelle, and good morning all. Yeah, my name is Olaf, and it really is a pleasure to be here to be talking to you all about some of my thoughts and opinions on additive manufacturing and how design for additive manufacturing in particular is one of the keys to the adoption uh, of it by industry. But maybe before we start, I've got two or three slides about me and my background and where I come from. Um, so this here is the story of my life. Uh, I've sort of lived pretty much all over the world, born in New Zealand, grew up in America and then Canada, university in South Africa, then bounced around the world a bit. Now I've been in Sweden for five years now. And just because it's always good to show some embarrassing pictures, um, I studied electronics engineering in South Africa, but while I was studying electronics engineering, I was also in a medieval music group. So that's my embarrassing picture. What I do today is product development. So I develop products in all sorts of areas from concept to detailed engineering design, manufacturing, and then getting them out to, the, to market. I think over the last 30 years, I've probably got about 100 products out to market in all sorts of areas, a lot of lighting products, control products, home health monitoring products, marine products, a little bit of everything. And this is really what got me interested in additive manufacturing as a tool, I guess, to develop better products faster. And I first got very interested in CAD, and then the next, the natural extension of that was to look at additive manufacturing as a tool to realize the CAD. But I guess today we're gonna to be talking about a slightly more involved area, area of additive manufacturing. And most people today still designed or print parts that have not been designed for additive manufacturing. And though you can do it, you're often not adding a huge amount of value. So I guess where we'll start is I think a really well-known graph that almost everybody in the world of additive manufacturing has seen. It's from the Walrus Report. It's the growth of additive manufacturing. It's just phenomenal, unbelievable growth where last year over 20% growth in the additive manufacturing sector in general. Metal in particular, incredible, 80% growth in a year. I mean, that is almost unbelievable, but the numbers are there. But what I've been finding, particularly over the last five or 10 years, yes, the growth is huge, but in general, I think the growth is, it's driven by the big boys, the, the Siemens of the world, the, 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 the GEs, the Airbus, the Boeing. There's not many SMEs that you can walk into today and see them using additive manufacturing for production. For prototyping, absolutely everybody's using it. For production, not many small businesses are using it. And the, the main reason for that is actually relatively straightforward. It's the costs are high. Additively manufactured parts can be very, very expensive. So I thought today we'd look a little bit at you know, some of the factors that determine what affects the cost of additively manufactured parts. And then 
can your design affect that price? If you can design the parts to make them 30% cheaper, 60% cheaper, 90% cheaper, well, it's sort of a no-brainer. It's a win-win for everybody. So I think the two biggest factors that affect um, additively manufactured power prices. So there are various other factors that I'm not going to be talking about today, things like material price. The materials are expensive, but in the overall scheme, it's not a big uh, portion of the price. The same with labor. There is labor in there, but it's not a big cost. By far, the single biggest cost is machine time. So in general, additively man additive manufacturing is a slow process. It's a serial process where most technologies will take a slice of the layer and draw it. So they'll have a laser tracing it or an extrusion head drawing it. But that means the, the, the laser or the print head has to cover a long distance. And print times you know, often range from you know, three hours, four hours, but can also go 50 hours to several hundred hours. Particularly with metal additive manufacturing, it can be tremendously uh, long jobs. So on screen there, you can see some of the average machine prices and the hourly running costs for those machines can vary somewhere between $35 an hour up to about $90 an hour. I guess it depends on your payback period. So these ones, we want to pay back the machine in say two years because it's a, it's a technology that's changing quickly. A lot of companies want to pay, for, pay back for it relatively quickly. So average price, you might say, is around $60, $65 an hour. The other big, big, big area of cost for additive manufacturing is post-processing. So a lot of people think, well, you print the parts and you get these beautiful mirror quality parts coming off. Unfortunately today, that's not the case. All technologies require quite a bit of post-processing. So post-processing is the work you have to do after the part has been printed. So again, um, the Wallers Report did a survey last year asking service providers what percentage of the cost of their parts was in pre processing in printing and then post-processing. And if you look at metal parts, for example, about 45% of the cost of the part is not the printing, it's the pre and post-processing. Same with plastic parts, about 31%. So just to give you a little bit more, for those of you who are not familiar with process, post-processing in terms of handling parts, and that applies to plastic, metal, and everything else, the idea that you can get perfect parts coming off the machine today is very much a myth. At the very least, you're going to have to remove support material. You're going to have to polish the parts, maybe machine them, maybe paint the parts. There's very many, many different processes for it in terms of post-processing. Today, I'm going to be talking mostly about metal because that's the big area of adoption by industry. We saw 80% growth last year. But it's also the area where a lot of this is the most difficult, the post-processing, for example, and the cost is affected the most by design. So for those of you who are not familiar with post-processing. I always refer to it as additive manufacturing's dirty little secret. So what you're seeing on there is that we had a conference in New Zealand about six years ago and we printed a whole bunch of little adjustable wrenches to give to people. But these are moving wrenches. But you see what you see there on screen is the wrenches still welded to the print plate and all those areas that are highlighted by the arrows is support material. So all of that material has to be removed. And in this case, the only practical way to remove it in this case is by hand. So that's quite a few hours of work to get in there to do it. So that's something you've got to take into account. I've got one of the nice little examples, a personal one. I, I have a hobby of making 3D printed guitars. This was an aluminum guitar printed last year. This is the guitar body still welded to the print plate. So it's the whole guitar is printed in aluminum with powder, with powder bed fusion, and the whole thing is printed to that print plate. And I'll just zoom in a little bit so you can see some of the support material. So the guitar theme is sort of barbed wire and roses. And what you see there is support material. All that support material between the, the barbed wire and in the flower petals, all of that has to be removed. And in this case, the only practical way to remove it is by hand. So the end result is pretty nice, if, if I may say so myself. But what you've got to be aware of is the time it took to get there. So in this case, the print time with aluminum, it's relatively quick to print, only nine hours of printing. But then we had about 30 plus hours, 33 hours of heat treatment afterwards. The first one I built, it took me four days to remove all the support material. My hands were literally bleeding by the end of it. It was always the trick is when it's the first time you do a part, you've got to figure out the best technique for removing the support material. Then another four days of shop cleaning, filing, sanding to get it to, with a decent surface finish. The second one I built took me two days and two days, but that's still four days of post-processing, which is quite substantial. 
just give you an, another example before we move on to the costing part of things. Again, this was signed, a project I did about three or four months ago. We just got a new metal machine at Lund University and we were figuring out how to use it. So for fun, I printed out some of these sort of chain mail tie bracelets. And they look fairly nice there, but just to give you a better idea of the process to get to that finished stage, here you can see the bracelet as it comes off the machine at the top of the screen. So you can see the surface finish on down facing parts is pretty awful. So the down facing parts is where the support material is attached. And that's where you get a really, really rough surface finish. So in this case, I printed the bracelets at an angle of about 30 degrees. Printing parts horizontally, again, can be very difficult because you end up having cracking in the parts. To remove the support material took about 30 minutes. And then the second picture, I just linished them. I ran them on a belt sander just to get the, the surface looking roughly, you know, pretty smooth. That took about 30 minutes as well. Then shot, uh, shot peened them with glass beads. That took a few minutes, really. And then the final step was to polish them to the state you see down at the, at the very bottom of the screen. That was four, four to five hours of polishing. So again, substantial post-processing time. So here we have about you know, 50% of the build time or 50% of the cost would have been post-processing rather than machine time. So as I said, the whole area of post-processing is pretty phenomenal. So going back to what determines a cost. So let's say we've got an average cost of say $65 an hour. If a part takes 10 hours to print, well, that's $650 of machine time. Probably, who cares? It's not that big a cost. Well, for students, it probably is a big cost, but in, in the greater scheme of things, it's not huge. But if it takes 100 hours to print, that's six and a half grand, that's six and a half thousand dollars. Now it's starting to get fairly serious. On top of that, you add the post-processing. So 45% of the cost could be post-processing suddenly your 100 hour part now jumps up to $12,000. So now you can really start to see where, if you can figure out ways to reduce that cost, then you can actually save a lot of money and actually add a lot of value to additive manufacturing in general. So the first question becomes then, what parts of the additively manufactured part do we have control over as engineers and designers? There's many, many parts to the additive man manufacturing process. So, to give you a simple example, when you look at the, the section on printing the parts, there's, you've got to spread a layer of powder in a metal system. So it's called recoating, the time it takes to spread a layer of powder. So depending on the brand of machine, it ranges from say five seconds to 15 seconds, roughly. Now, if you have a part that's 100 millimeters tall, whether your part is well designed or badly designed, the recoater time is going to be the same for both of those parts. So, what I'm saying here is that the recoder time, for example, is not something that you have control over as a designer. You cannot affect it and take, well, other than lowering the height of your part, of course. Other things, the laser, you imagine you're drawing a, a black square on a piece of paper. You're gonna take your pencil, you'll draw the outside of the square, and then you'll take your pencil, rub it backwards and forwards to hatch to fill the inside of the square. Um, laser melting systems do exactly the same thing. So the laser traces the outside of the slice and then hatches, scans the inside of the slice many, many, many times to get that, um, to, to melt all the powder in that particular layer. So those two factors are ones that, and I'll, I'll talk about it more in a, few, in a few slides, those two factors are ones that you can definitely affect by your design. Other things, stress relief. I mean, the, the time it takes to heat treat the part afterwards the difference between a well-designed and a badly de designed part can be phenomenal. And the same, removing support structures. Again, from a badly designed part, you can have a lot more support than on a well-designed part. So I thought maybe the best way to illustrate this was through a relatively simple example. So here we've got a block manifold. So it's basically a block of metal, in this case it could be steel, with a bunch of pipes drilled into it. Some of the pipes are blocked, and the idea, idea is you can put hydraulic fluid into the inlet down the bottom and then it'll redistribute the, the hydraulic fluid to all the other channels that it needs to go through. So this is a common way today of making manifolds. Many, many products, industrial products have exactly this kind of manifold in there. So if we look at this manifold from uh, additive manufacturing cost point of view, and we don't do any redesign, we just decide we're gonna print it as is. In this case, if you imagine taking a slice through that cube, the picture on the right shows what that slice looks like. And the blue lines you can just see on screen there, those are the, the lines that the laser has to scan. So the laser is gonna travel along all those blue lines. So if our, our um, block manifold is 100 millimeters cubed, 
which in, in American units would be what, three inches or something like that, or so three inch by three inch by three inch. And the hatch spacing, so the hatch spacing is the distance between each of the, of the blue lines uh, that the laser has to trace over. At 0 0.1 millimeters um, spacing, that's a fairly common spacing used. That means the laser has to travel 100 meters. That's 33 yards or something like that to cover one layer of the square. So if the laser is traveling, let's say 330 millimeters per second, that's about five minutes the laser takes to draw that slice of the model. Now, if you've got a more powerful laser, of course, you can move a lot quicker. So at $65 an hour, that's about $5 and 40 odd cents worth of machine time per layer. So you think, well, $5, that's not too bad per layer. Let's imagine our layer thickness is 50 microns, which is actually pretty thick for a metal part. A lot of them are in 20 microns or 40 microns. So at 50 microns per layer at 100 millimeters high, well, that means you've got 2,000 layers. So suddenly your $5 jumps up to $10,000. So you can immediately start to see in fairly clear, clear terms why, you know, if you can find ways to reduce that cost, that's a huge benefit. So I'll first show you, start by showing you a very simple way. You can shell the cube. So in most CAD programs, there's a shell function, which allows you to set a wall thickness of say two millimeters or three millimeters, whatever you want, and it removes all the other material. So if we shell this cube, so we hollow it out, which you can see on the left there, looks identical from the inside, all the pipes are identical, but now you look at the picture on the right where we've taken a slice of the model, now the laser has much, much less area to scan. So in this case, with a two, mil wall, two millimeter wall thickness, our laser travel distance has dropped down to 4.5 meters. So that's a over 90% reduction of the scan distance it had to do, 95% reduction in fact. So we've dropped down from five minutes to 13 odd seconds, which is about 24 cents per layer. So suddenly you can start to see a major impact that the mass of material plays on cost. And mass, avoiding big masses of materials is probably one of the key areas of design for AM. Then we're gonna talk about avoiding support material. So the next slide, I guess, talks, so my thoughts on the thought process you go through when you design for AM. So the first step I always go through is look at what features of the part perform a useful function. And to my mind, anything in the part that does not serve a useful function is useless, get rid of it. So in the case of a block manifold, it's the pipes inside the block that serve a useful function. They're getting hydraulic fluid to, to where it needs to go. So get rid of all the other material. In other words, shell it out, but get rid of the outside faces to just leave the pipes. And generally speaking, anything that breaks the even thickness rule. So this is not just additive manufacturing. Many manufacturing processes or injection molding, the golden rule is um, keeping an even wall thickness. With additive, it's even more important to have everything with an even wall thickness if you can. Next step is if you've got separate bodies by the first step, you might decide how to join them together. Then you look at what the best print orientation is gonna be, because depending which, which way you orient them, you rotate them to print them, you can have more or less support material. So you run it through the support generation software to see what the effect is gonna be. And then from there, the two main techniques, if you think about support material as being a temporary wall to conduct heat away from the part, well, think about is it possible to replace it with a permanent wall that becomes a feature of the part? And changing the angle. So depending on the machine you're using, usually 45 degrees is the magic number where anything that's less than 45 degrees will need support material. Anything that's more than closer to vertical from 45 degrees won't need support material. So to give you the example with our little manifold, so the first step is you get rid of everything else. I performed a shell operation in this case. And what I'm left with is a set of pipes. That is the bare function of the manifold. Then on the right-hand side, the top right, you can see the manifold being run through the support material. All the blue stuff there is support material. So effectively, that's sacrificial material that after it's printed, we're gonna break away. So now I ask myself the question is, could I, for example, remove that blue support material and replace it with permanent walls? And that's what you see on the bottom left is the same manifold where all I've done is where there was support material, and I put permanent walls that become a feature of the part. In this case, I've also put some elliptical holes in there to try to lightweight them as much as possible. And what you see on the bottom right is the part as it will be printed with just a little bit of support material that welds it to the plate. That means when you're finished, you cut it off and you're done, ready to go 
everything's done. So two big advantages, we've reduced the print time a huge amount, and we've also been able to remove, reduce the post-processing, because now we don't actually have to remove all that support material that we had uh, before. So just to give you some numbers on this particular part, that's some numbers showing you that part, and these are real quotes I got from online service bureaus, so the solid part, the shelled part, and the design for AM part. So you can see the print times run from 190 to 19 hours. That's a fairly substantial reduction. But the big one, and as I said, I'll repeat it, these are real prices, $15,000 for the additively manufactured solid block of steel, compared to 3,700 for the shelled part, for the hollowed part, already a big improvement, and just under $2,000 for the, um, the part that's been done with design for AM. So that really you know, paints a perfect picture of why designing for AM is so important. And it's not really something you wanna avoid. It's, to me, it's not a luxury, it's not a nice to have thing. It's something you have to do if you're gonna be wanting to use additive manufacturing. So we're getting close to the end now, but I thought before we do, I'd, I'd share sort of my seven golden rules of additive manufacturing. The first three, I guess, are general rules, and the bottom four are technical engineering rules. So the first rule of design for AM is it depends. And what I mean by that is most design rules for AM are it depends. So as an example, what's the smallest hole size you can get through a part? Well, it depends on the thickness of the wall it has to go through, for example. So that's a perfect example of an it depends rule. Probably the biggest rule from a student point of view is a second rule is should you actually be using additive manufacturing in the first place and to me this emphasizes that not everything should be done with additive manufacturing at our university we have a lot of we have we've got a lot of desktop printers sort of a maker space for it that's free for students to use and a lot of the time i walk past and i see students printing squares and i say well you've got a laser cutter that'll do a better job faster out of more material why are you printing and often the answer is because i can so just to repeat, you know, geometric complexity, for example, is one of the requirements for something to be worth 3D printing. My general guidelines, if you can machine it on a three-axis CNC machine, you're probably better off machining it than printing it. From a cost point of view, surface finish point of view, uh, metallurgical point of view, plastic point of view, the, the integrity of the part. Number three rule, doesn't cost anything to make, uh, more to make your product beautiful. And what I mean by that is, I mean, beauty, of course, is highly subjective, but even simple things like putting your logo on the part, putting part numbers, um, assembly instructions, print them on the part, it doesn't cost you anything more. And in fact, if you cut them into the part, so if your logos and your text are cut into the part, well, again, that's less material for the laser to have to melt, therefore it actually reduces your cost by adding all this cosmetic detail onto your parts in the best possible way. Then we get to the, the, the last four rules, which are the, call it the technical rules. Uh, number four is always design with print orientation in mind. So which orientation you print your part in will affect the material property. So most processes, most of you guys will be used to fuse deposition modeling, so uh, material extrusion processes. Uh, from that, you'll know that it's always weak in the vertical direction. So between the layers is always a weakness. Um, surface finish, again, different orientation will affect of your part so really critical to know which orientation you're going to print it in so you can design to give it the best surface finish the best strength properties you can possibly have um, design to avoid support materials rule, rule number five so support material means labor which means post-processing so a lot of money if you can design to minimize post-processing as i did in that previous manifold exercise it's a winner every day. And the two basic simplest techniques is change the angles of your parts so you don't have um, overhangs that are say 90 degree overhangs, they will need support material. Or if you do need support material, think about using a permanent wall as part of the part rather than temporary support. You can't do it in all cases, in some cases you absolutely do it, in that case, nothing wrong with support material. But always think that if it's possible to try to get rid of it. And the last two rules, avoid large masses of material. So big lumps of material in your part hugely increase your cost. And they can increase your cost by 30%, 50%, 70% relatively easily. They also increase your heat treatment time because if you've got masses of material, you can have more residual stress in your part, which means more heat treatment to get rid of it. And that residual stress is another reason why you need more support material. So having everything in an even wall thickness 
by far is the biggest design for additive manufacturing tip I can give you in my opinion. And the other last one is fillet everything. So round all the corners, particularly internal corners. If you have a 90 degree internal corner that's sharp, that is where you're gonna get stress concentration or stress raises. That is where your part is gonna crack. Cr crack. By filleting it, by rounding it off to say half a millimeter or a millimeter, usually a quarter of the thickness, um, you avoid that stress concentration and you avoid a lot of So just to finish off, we've got about five minutes before we finish off. I thought I, thought I would share a real case study of a product we did last year for Atlas Copco, um, a mining company up in the north of Sweden, and they do mining equipment. So this, what you're seeing there is a manifold, very similar to the manifold I just saw, showed you in a simplified form. This is a real manifold. What you're seeing there, it's a block of stainless steel with a whole bunch of pipes drilled into it. Some of the pipes um, um, uh, blocked to get the hydraulic fluid where it needs to be. There's pumps, there's sensors on it. So Atlas Copco wanted to find, this is on the, in an underground drilling rig on the end of a boom arm. So the lighter we can get it, the bigger the advantage is for the underground drilling rig from that point of view. So in this case, we redesigned it into the section that you see in the middle. So it went from 14.6 to 1.3 kilos. So that's, again, 90% weight saving there. I mean, that is tremendous in terms of the value it adds to the tractor. Um, to show you the same part, this is now the part with the support material generated. Now, in this particular case, it would have been possibly more sensible to print it the other way around, but they didn't want any support material inside the pipes. That's why we were forced to print it this way. So there is some support material on it, but it is very easy to remove support. It's A, easily accessible and not a huge amount of it. And just to show you the real part, so this is the part being printed or just after it's been printed still in the powder bed fusion system. Most of the powder removed on the, on the left and on the right you can see it there with um, most of the, uh, the powder removed. And this is it now with the support material removed. So you can see the surface finish on all those down facing parts is pretty awful. It's pretty nasty at best. So that's quite a few hours of filing to get it looking like a half decent part that you'd be willing to, to show to somebody. And this is the part in my hands in front of the laptop I'm talking to you guys on this very minute. Still needs a little bit more, you know, uh, make it look a little bit shinier and all that. This is now at a stage where it is. So this gives you a nice real world case study of using design for additive manufacturing in a way where we've lost, you know, over 90% of the weight of the part. We've reduced the print time. Well, you probably wouldn't have printed that block. It would just be a, a silly part to print. It would be too expensive. But we've reduced the print time nevertheless by over about 95% in this particular case. I mean, that is a big cost saving if you remember that the big part of the cost is a print time. So hopefully this gives you a very, very brief overview of why designing for AM is so critical. Now I've used metal in this particular presentation Exactly the same thing applies if you're doing laser sintering or stereolithography or fuse deposition modeling. Doesn't really matter what technology you're using, the importance of designing your parts to make them as easy as possible to print, as quick as possible to print, and as little post-processing as possible um, to get there is absolutely critical in my opinion. So I thought I'd leave you with the, the, the thought, you know, AM is really, really, it's an amazing technology, but you've got to understand it so you know how to design for it. Um, my email address is there on screen. So if any of you guys have got questions, anything you want to know about what I've talked about or anything else, feel free to drop me an email and I'll reply to it as, as fast as I can. So with that, um, thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me and um, I bid you a good day. Thank you very much.